Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really have what I'm considering a rock star lineup for you all. Um, but to do the formal welcome is our hostess for tonight. Uh, many of you from Princeton know Shirley Satterfield. So Shirley, if you'll come up and say welcome. Good evening, everyone. Good everyone evening. here, and good evening to all of you who are watching us on Zoom. Morven Museum and Gardens warmly welcomes you to the splendid evening to listen, learn, discover, and discuss the world renowned achievements of four distinguished scientists, researchers, and mathematicians who, through three decades, their outstanding achievements total nearly 800 patents, as well as individual recognitions for their scientific and technological contributions. After our time of gathering and meeting, we now have this special time to hear the panel of four distinguished 20th century scientists whose time at Bell Labs was a glowing and noted renaissance. It is my honor to introduce our Bell Labs persons of distinction and invention. Mr. Clyde Bathia, Dr. Marion Croak, Dr. William Massey, Dr. James West. As they come together as a panel for discussion, know that each brings his her own accomplishments that opened up a better world through their dedicated work. And I just have something else to say. I may have known some of them if I knew that they were Bell Labs. I lived a hop, skip and jump from Bell Labs in Murray Hill. So if you had thrown a stone, you would have come to my house. <laughs> so I just wanted to say welcome and I'm glad to meet you and enjoy. But please don't throw stones at Shirley. <laughs> so, Shirley's been a wonderful part of our education committee, and I thank you for welcoming everyone tonight. Uh, just to re reiterate what Shirley said, we are honored to have four trailblazing scientists with us this evening, all remarkable Bell Labs alum. Our moderator this evening is Professor William Massey the Edwin S. Wilsey Professor of Operations Research and Financial Engineering at Princeton University, and the first tenured African-American mathematician at an Ivy League university. Wow. Wow. Oh, wait, there's more. Uh, in 1995, Dr. Massey founded the Council for African-American Researchers in the Mathematical Sciences, a forum for minority researchers to meet and learn about their work across fields. This was also a place, or is also a place, for graduate students to meet professional mentors. 
In 2006, Dr. Massey won the Blackwell Tapia Award for his, quote, outstanding re record of achievement in mathematical research and his mentoring of minorities and women in the field of mathematics, end quote. In 2013, it's not over. In 2013, he became a member of the inaugural class of the American Mathematical Society of Fellows. He has long been quoted of saying, everything I know about mentoring, I learned at Bell Laboratories. 35 miles north of, north of Princeton in Murray Hill, New Jersey, Massey bore witness to history in the making as a critical mass of minority researchers at Bell Labs helped establish trailblazing programs, including the fellowship that paid for his own PhD and for those of over 200 other minority scientists. Massey coined the term for this period at Bell Labs as the Black Scientific Renaissance, just like Harlem in the 1920s was for African American artists and poets. Tonight, he will lead us through the stories behind some of those trailblazers. We welcome Dr. Macy. I know some people were thanking me for organizing an event. I said, no, 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 no. Uh, Jim dragged me into this event. <laughs> and I'm just happy to help out. Okay. <laughs> and um, of the six pictures you see here, um, so. Okay. Hear that? Does that sound better? Okay, so of the six photos you see here, uh, Three of us are here in person. Um, two of us sadly passed away, so they're here in spirit. And one of us is here on Zoom. Okay. <laughs> so um, now you may be thinking, um, these are nice photos, except it seems like a lot of details are missing. Like, who are these people? What have they done? And that's the whole point of this, um, the, the first hour presentation is to just fill in some of those details. So we'll start here uh, with uh, Walter Lincoln Hawkins, but he's always called Link, Link Hawkins. And um, <clears throat> if you read uh, the, the logos at the bottom, that's sort of the chronology of, he was an undergrad at Rensselaer Polytechnic. He got his, um, he did like a, um, masters at uh, Howard University and then he spent a year <clears throat> building almost like a pre-doc at Columbia University then he got his PhD at McGill University and then he joined Bell Labs and there are many reasons we're starting with him but um, the most important one is is um, he was one of the first um, scientists to ever work at the labs. And if you want to get a sense of his claim to fame, what did he do? Okay, so here's what put him in the inventors, National Inventors Hall of Fame. That he, um, in the 1940s, up to that point, um, copper cables for, you know, for telephone wires, they were coated with lead. Now, the problem with lead is that, well, since it's very malleable, um, birds like to pick away at it and eating and eat them. And, the, you know, this is clearly not very good for the environment. And so they wanted to find an alternate way, um, an alternate type of sheath for the wires. And some people said, well, what about plastic? That was a big thing in the 40s. And it said, the only problem is these cables are sitting out there in the sun and ultraviolet light makes most plastic brittle. So Link Hawkins innovation was to come up with a, um, a plastic that was impervious to ultraviolet radiation. Okay, so that allowed him uh, allowed the phone company to save uh, uncount countless uh, numbers of money, um, maybe about billions, trillions, um, by doing things this way. And for our story, uh, another important thing, uh, like I said, 
the first black scientist, and he started Bell Labs in 1942. So it seems like historically, uh, 1942 seems to be a focal point for um, black, black science in New Jersey. Because okay. what happened during this time? Okay. okay, so, okay, you guessed it, I'm in mathematics. So <laughs> I knew that um, one of the most outstanding black mathematicians of the 20th century is David Blackwell. And he visited the Institute of Advanced Study. Well, he started in fall of 41, but he was still there in the spring of 1942. Okay. And then there was another fellow, another giant of black mathematics, Janus Wilkins. Uh, he was the youngest mathematician to ever get a PhD in math from the University of Chicago. He got it at the age of 19. Okay. And he was, uh, so he was left there to join the, visit the Institute uh, for, in the fall of 1942. Uh, and then he would go from there to work on the Manhattan Project. Okay. Chicago, so he was born and raised in Chicago. And I just think it's a, uh, just very interesting that here are these three pioneering black scientists, all in New Jersey in the year of 1942. Okay. And give you a sense of how far back that was. Um, notice that um, this is not a picture of Jackie Robinson wearing the uniform for the um, Brooklyn Dodgers because that didn't happen until 1947. Okay, this is 1942. Okay, so, so that's how innovative it was. It was like five years before um, baseball, you know, integrate the major leagues. So now we go from there to James West. Okay, so we go from the 1940s to the late 1950s because I think you started with 59, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, here is career path, uh, undergrad started off at Hampton University. Then he went to Temple and then he started Bell Labs when it was a monopoly. So I guess the critical time is before 1984. So way before, okay, so. Then it was AT&T, then um, the Bell Labs part we were part of became a part of Lucent Technologies. And then in the, in the 21st century has been spending his time at the um, Johns Hopkins. And this schematic is from what put him in the National Inventors Hall of Fame. And this is um, the electric microphone or I used to think of the Hoyle electric microphone. And uh, so they sort of reinvented the notion of uh, microphone technology and which allowed it to make it a much smaller device. You know, if you think about, um, you know, like a 1940s movie where you see like a radio show and there's a big device in front of them, uh, that was life before the Hoyle electric. And so this is what made um, wireless communications, you know, you fit into cell phones and other small devices. And um, so the advantage I have is that since I'm a mathematician, so if you hear me talk about anything that has to do with tele telecommunications, I didn't know any of that when I was a grad student in, in mathematics. I just sort of picked that up you know, working at the labs. And um, what I came to understand is, okay, how does a microphone work? Okay, there are, your voice generates sound waves through the air, you know, sort of air pressure waves, and it makes things compress and expand. And then <clears throat> resulting air pressure waves hit the microphone diaphragm, make the diaphragm move up and down. And you think of this device as really like a large capacitor. And that change in capacitance converts your voice into transmittable electrical signals. Okay. 
So why did I drag you through all that? Um, you should, the takeaway is that you, you should really think of a microphone as like an electronic version of a drum. Okay. So as a device for communication. So um, this is really an electronic update of the notion of a talking drum, you know, uh, as a means of communication, you know, through um, pressures on a diaphragm. Okay. I thought it was pretty interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, so, so I went to Princeton, I got to plug Princeton here. So Jim got an honorary degree uh, Princeton in 2014. And um, in fact, let me embarrass Jennifer Rexford because she was very helpful, you know, because I, I lobby for it and Jennifer helped me make, you know, lobby to make sure that, um, actually, Jennifer, why don't you stand up? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, um, so that, you know, so she helped us get, uh, she's a, a, a chair of the uh, computer science department at Princeton. And so, um, so um, that was, so that was a great event, you know, 2014. And, um, but now what's Jim been up to lately? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that um, this was an article, IEEE Spectrum from 2019. Okay, so he's looking at a new invention of a smart stethoscope to put AI in medics ears. And um, I should tell you, I was talking to a, a friend of mine who was the, um, used to be the assistant principal at my old high school. And so I showed him this article and he's 85 and he was feeling like, boy, maybe I need to do more than just <laughs> go fishing. <laughs> But, um, but that's not the end of it. There is some uh, hot off the press, some new work that Jim's developing. And Jim, you'd like to tell us some more about it? Thank you, Bill. And ladies and gentlemen, it's really my pleasure to be here to see so many people that I haven't seen for quite a while. And what I wanna talk a little bit about is a project that my daughter Ellington and I are working on. Um, Bill mentioned the um, smart stethoscope using artificial intelligence. Well, we did this work to aid people in the third world where instrumentation and trained people don't really exist. And so we wanted to create a device that did not depend on a trained person to be able to detect pneumonia and in infants. And um, this worked very well in a quiet environment, like a doctor's office. But what we found out is that clinics in Peru and in Bangladesh, a street corner stores, sometimes not even enclosed and in, in open air cars going by other babies crying so one thing we learned about artificial intelligence is, is that it requires a pure signal as pure a signal as you can possibly give it and so the instrument got very expensive because what we did you know noise canceling headphones work and this is a reasonably easy problem to solve because it's a closed volume nothing is moving but now if you want to invert that and mitigate sound that can come from anywhere in the environment, the computational complexity is very strong. And in fact, it is the major cost in the device. And so my students and I came up with a different solution, a mechanical solution. Stethoscopes are basically a microphone electronic stethoscopes with a microphone and some amplification and some signal processing. But for the most part, it just mimics the mechanical scope. And 
Uh, for example, airplanes are required to have stethoscopes on board, but nobody can hear anything if they try to use it because the noise level in the airplane is too high. And so what we did was to look at this problem in a very serious way and found that we could solve it. Remember, microphones are made to and designed to pick up sound from the air. So it's characteristic impedance, what it likes to see and where it transfers the most energy is when that match is made. My students made a microphone that matched salt water, which is what our bodies, which is the main component of, of our bodies. And if you scan that down, Bill, I think I've gotten sure. through that part. Thank you. Yeah, the, the device looks very much like the other one. Oh, that's good. Um, the difference is that it does not, it's insensitive to airborne sound. And when you put it on your chest, it's extremely sensitive to the sound from the body. So this is going to allow us to make a very inexpensive instrument for use in the third world. Now, I've learned a lot over the years since I've been in, in, in this field. And in fact, I gave a talk at uh, Morgan State University and the first question was, why did I go to Bangladesh and to, to uh, other countries when it's a prevalent problem right in the city of Baltimore? So um, I think I'm going to leave it at that, Bill. I can go on and on, as you can imagine. <laughs> OK, thank you, Jim. Okay, so now we go to, well, if you've been through the exhibits, you know who uh, Clyde Bethea is. And he has, um, you know, his chronology here. He was at the, um, I guess, uh, what, New York uh, Technological yes. University and the Stevens Institute of Technology, New Jersey. Institute of Technology, and then he went through a Bell, you know, when it was Ma Bell, and then AT and T, and then Lucent Technologies, and then even Aguirre, you know, when um, well, not Aguirre. Um, let's see, well, you tell me, Clyde. Bell Labs. Aguirre. It was always Bell Labs. Okay. It was always the opportunity in Bell Labs. Yeah, so it was just, um, All 35 years at Bell Labs. Right, right. It's all, I mean, <laughs> these were the homes for Bell Labs. Okay, so in fact, now Nokia is, I guess, the home, the new home for yeah. Bell Labs. So, um, oh, by the way, if you look at to the far uh, right, that's a picture of Clyde when he was uh, 26 years old. <laughs> The big one, <laughs> not the little one. <laughs> okay, and then let me uh, do this. This was a story, and I guess the takeaway is the importance of the Tuskegee Airmen and um, what what effect that why what effect did that have on the. Um, well, reading, when you read the text, do I sound okay? My sound coming out okay? Okay. I hear you. Uh, the, the scientists at Bell Laboratories and technicians, they went through uh, World War II in the flying fortresses, the B-17 and the B-26 flying fortresses, but they were escorted by the Tuskegee Airmen, which were called the Red Tails. And at the time, they didn't even know uh, who these guys were. But let, when they found out who they were, um, you know, one uh, plane flew in and, and actually uh, wound up in the uh, Tuskegee Airmen's hangar. And they found out that all these guys were black pilots and black technicians. But make a long story short, these guys flew alongside the to the bombers and they lost very little 
of these 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 bombers. I mean, these are ten man crews, and so they did everything they could to keep these planes from being shot down by enemy uh, fighter pilots. They couldn't do anything about the flak, but they could do a lot uh, to protect these guys from the, the the fighter pilots. Anyway, when they got home, they recognized the 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 sacrifices that these guys made. And all of these guys became my godfathers. And, and the reason was they found out that a lot of them wouldn't have been there had it not been for the Tuskegee Airmen. And uh, same thing uh, for my department head, Bart Miller, Dr. R.C. Miller. He was in General Patton's uh, tank battalions. Not only were they black uh, tankers, they were called the Black Panthers the original Black Panthers, these were the tankers in, in, in Patton's Third Army, but so were the truckers. For 82 days, they called it the Red Ball Express. These guys drove trucks along this highway to supply ammunition. This was the logistics that they, they, they had to do. They had to supply all these uh, type of ammunition, uh, gas, gasoline, uh, food, water, everything. Anyway, they did this for 82 days straight. 75% of those guys were black American soldiers. And that my, my department head uh, told me about these guys. And because of their sacrifices, uh, these guys even had machine guns <laughs> mounted on their trucks, fighting all the way down the, the, the highway. But uh, he, became my mentor, my de that department head. And he told his, his uh, technician, Bill Nordlin, to teach me crystallography, to teach me X-ray diffraction. I was doing laser physics, but I was also doing uh, a lot of other, other things like X-ray diffraction, uh, looking at crystallography. And, and this guy taught me all this stuff. And, and one of the reasons was these truckers. They recognized these guys made the sacrifices and they felt that, you know, they wanted to try to pay some of that back. And so they protected me for like 30 years. The, the pilots, the navigators, the bombardiers, and uh, they taught me technical stuff. They taught me uh, physics. Because, you know, you learn physics in college, but then there's physics in the research lab. And it's a little different. And so that, that, that's basically what I went through with these guys. So it was like, nobody could touch me with these guys. I mean, they just protected me from every aspect that you could possibly think of, politics, techno technological things. And then there's these other two guys, Jim West and Sam Williamson. Well, they told, told me to join the I IEEE journal, you know, the IEEE. Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. And they were correct because we get rated every year. And one of the things that weighed heavy in a Matt review was a, a, a society like the IEEE, which actually helped me get promoted. Every, every year I got promoted, first year was IEEE, second year was senior member of IEEE. So I wanted to thank Jim West and Sam Williamson pointing that out to me when I first came into Bell Labs in 1970. Okay, next slide. Um, now let me... Okay, so mention some of this work slide you'd done from 87 to 93. Yeah, that was for the uh, Strategic Missile uh, Defense Command. We had developed detectors that were impervious to radiation and couldn't be blinded by lasers. And uh, well, the department head, Federico, asked me to build a camera. And it was a test to see if it could be done. It was a, uh, a scanning mirror camera. And then the, when that worked, Bill Brinkman, who was executive director, said, Look, I want a focal plane array. I said, how many pixels? He said, 128 by 128. I said, okay. He said, how long? I said, you know, a few months, maybe nine months. He said, how much? I said, mm, a few hundred grand. So uh, the result of that was we worked on the camera 
in, in 1990s, but you notice we started in 1987 on the original pixels. The significance of this is the material doesn't exist in nature. You need quantum physics in order to develop these particular materials. And what, what happened was the military wanted it because it was impervious to nuclear radiation, it was, it's impervious to electromagnetic radiation in, in terms of damage. And uh, they were, they're now still working on these cameras. The military is working on it, uh, but NASA wanted it. And, and basically we had to transfer the technology to the Jet Propulsion Laboratories because at the time Bell Labs didn't really want to work on that type of uh, technology. And so our postdocs came back, <clears throat> excuse me, from the JPL and asked me to give them the equations and teach them how to do it. And basically they did this for NASA and ended up in the uh, Space Foundation Hall of Fame sponsored by NASA. Okay, so 21st century to 2005, 2010, R&D work for this uh, Army for Warfighters group? Yes, they gave us a multi-million dollar contract, <clears throat> excuse me, and asked me to design some systems. These are systems, all weather systems. Uh, it was funny because I started out on my kitchen table and my wife looked at it and she said, oh no, oh no, this ain't happening. And so she built me a little lab downstairs in the basement and <laughs> took me off the table, you know? And so what happened was the first two, uh, uh, one was for a uh, tank or Jeep. The one on the right the top is actually for a, uh, a weapon system like the XM-50, uh, which is a, an assault weapon that goes on top of it. And it's an all weather camera system and tracking. It can track 10 targets simultaneously, either one. It, it really can track more than that, but they only want it eight to 10. So that system will track in the far infrared and in the visible, multiple targets simultaneously. And the bottom, was a uh, development between me and uh, Sarnoff Laboratories. That actually won the science award at Picatinny Austin because you notice there's multiple cameras and uh, the integrated system is a fire control system. They call it uh, uh, target recognition and fire control. It tracks and locks into multiple targets simultaneously, all weather, through trees, through smoke, at night, through rain, fog. And uh, that's the work I did at uh, Stevens Institute for, uh, actually for Vic, Victor uh, Lawrence, who was a Bell Labs director. So he called me in and asked me to help design these systems. So, you know, I wrote the contract with him and built these systems. Okay. Okay, Clyde, one more decade. <laughs> well, I'm still working on this because the, 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 int the interesting guy that I'm working with is uh, uh, an Arbor chair. Uh, he's from Africa. He's the actual director of the imaging uh, laboratories at uh, Southwestern, UT Southwestern. And we're still working on this. The first system I developed at home, it can see cysts, it can see uh, in, a t in a top ne next to the little computer, you, there's a cyst, there's a tumor behind a person's ear, which is benign. But on the right, what you'll see is what a cancer tumor looks like, a one centimeter cancer tumor. And it maps out the entire tumor in real time. The little black and white is the one centimeter uh, cold tumor on a mouse. What's significant about a cold tumor is that it's very difficult to see a breast cancer tumor, which is cold. And uh, this system can see cold or hot. And the little uh, diagram shows you like, there's a person down at the bottom on the left-hand side. And the camera scans the whole person. The laser 
uh, touches the skin, it's like a little pencil laser. It's not high powered. It's just the kind you point at the wall. And what you look, you look at, if it's benign and just skin, you notice the little peak is very sharp. And you, you, you looked at the little display where it says there's a little uh, green arrow pointing to the uh, real sharp peak. The bottom shows a little red arrow. That's a cancer tumor. And what happens is cancer tumors are heterogeneous. And in other words, there's a lot of structure. And so communication from communications theory, what they found out was uh, cancer tumors are, have a lot of entropy. And that, that, that's basically a simple equation that Shannon from Bell Laboratories worked out. And they use that in the medical field where they find out that the communications between tumors and cells are chaotic. And so they show a lot of entropy. And so if you look at the diagram, if you look at the real data where it says tumor, LSTI tumor, LSTI stands for laser stimulated thermal imaging. And you notice the blue region and the red region, that's that whole region is one centimeter. But the system, the little peak shows you that that's a few hundred microns uh, full width at max between the red and the yellow in that, di that, that diagram. That's how cancer shows up. A breast cancer tumor shows up with a lot of uh, chaos, whereas it's just a simple bell-shaped curve if it's, if it's a, a regular skin. And so the system works, it's patented, it's patent pending, and the only thing hold, holding it up is the lawyers right now, money and lawyers. But if you notice the, the camera has a little laser at the bottom, it, it, it's pointing to a little laser very at the very bottom of the uh, camera. The picture with the surgeon has glasses. That's this is a multiple system because the doctor I'm working with, he has a patent where and, and where he looks at tumors. They put dye in 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 the person, and a tumor shows up fluorescence. So his 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 glasses sees that. The camera sees it even before you cut a person open. And so these two systems are gonna, are gonna be working together and all the software is in that little computer. So you can build this in a small computer system. We could have them today. I mean, you know, you gotta go through the NIH and you know, all the parameters that you, and politics for medical, but we could have this thing working today if, if you know, we could get through all of that. But there's a lot of, uh, how can I say, you got to go through a lot of rings and hoops and do a lot of jumping around to get medical things out. It's much easier to work with the military because they like to kill people. <laughs> so, you know, they give you millions of dollars to do that. Oh yeah, you want to kill somebody, they give you a whole lot of money for that. When working in the medical field, Jim can attest to that. It's very difficult because, you know, this system is in competition with medical systems because you could put a handheld system together like that in a, in, a, in, a, in a laptop or in an iPad or even in a phone. So the idea was to build a system like this, to make it work. And the idea came to me because I was in a hospital with lymphoma in 2003. And I said, well, you know, I should be working on cancer tumors. And so I, was, I started working on these ideas to, to figure out how to detect breast cancer in real time. And it didn't take a lot of time to analyze it. So you're basically looking at a system that can probe the person's breast or neck or whatever. And you don't need to stick them with needles. You don't need to open them up. And you notice it says a one centimeter for the top curve. Well, it would take mammograms years to see this. Typically a mammogram sees a set of one centimeter with 50% probability. So if you got a one centimeter tumor and you got a, 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 a mammogram, it's 50% positive, 50% negative because it's a contrast thing that it will see the tumor. This system sees tumors down to millimeters with very high accuracy. So this is what we've been working on for the last 10 years. Okay, thank you, Clyde. <laughs> Go to uh, 
sort of a bittersweet moment to talk about James Wayne Hunt. Uh, of course, I've known for many years, so sadly he passed away last year. And the um, reason I'll talk about him because um, when you think of Jim West, you know, Jim would say one of his predecessors was Lincoln Hawkins, you know, somebody working at Bell Labs. Um, me, I was uh, being a black student at Princeton and then getting to Bell Labs, um, I would point to a predecessor being Wayne Hunt, um, because he, ironically, we both went to Princeton, we both got our PhDs at Stanford, but he was like four years ahead of me, so I didn't meet him until I got to work at Bell Labs in the 80s. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about him. So this is a paper he did um, during his summer as a graduate student. And, um, and how did he get in a position to do that in grad school? Well, uh, people like Jim West and Link Hawkins and other black scientists at the time were developing these outreach programs. And in 1972 was the debut of the Cooperative Research Fellowship Program. And so Wayne was one of the first winners of that. So Black Princetonians, he was, you know, so he was the first one to get it in 1973. And so that's where he met Thomas Zemanski. Um, and at the labs, and they were doing this paper that 45 years later is often quoted. It's called the hunt zemanski algorithm, okay? Um, but of course, I'm gonna tell you what it is. I mean, <laughs> not, not the details of it, because I, I looked at that paper and then that's a whole nother excursion into you know mathematics. But I'll tell you why it's so important. Uh, so this is just getting into the Unix um, operating system. So there's a command called uh, diff. What is it? So, oops, what's happened here? Let's see if this is going okay. Fine. Okay. So, for those of you in Unix, if you want to display a file, you use the word cat, you would cat the file, you know, that, oh, cat is shorthand for concatenate. But anyway, uh, this is sort of this, uh, you know, this is like an operating language developed, an expert language developed by, you know, by expert for other experts. So they call it cat. And you display another file, you would cat that file, you get that. And then what you'd like, the diff command tells you what is it that these two files do not have in common, okay? Well, how do you do that? Um, you uh, notice that, okay, so in the blue box, you'll see a less than sign, and that will tell you what's in the red file that's not in the green file. You see right below that, you see a greater than sign, and that's pointing to the line in the green file that's not in the red file, okay? Um, well, now you take those away and what's left? You got, you guessed it, the longest common subsequence of the two files, okay? So finding, having a fast algorithm that um, shows you how to do that gives you a very fast diff command. So this is one of the fundamental building blocks of the Unix operating system, so, okay. And here's some background in Wikipedia about the history of it. And um, now sadly it took, um, it turns out Wayne had gone on after he got his PhD to <laughs> to go on the corporate side, you know, go on the managerial side and be uh, promoted. Um, so that might've been one of the last research papers he ever wrote, but I mean, 
If you're only going to write one paper in your life, that's the way to do it. Okay. <laughs> and um, but now I was talking about before he was the first um, graduate of this Bell Labs Fellowship Program, and I decided to put a um, a um, copy of a, of the brochure of the program, but this is from the '90s. Because I figure this is, since this is basically a New Jersey story, so might as well make a shout out to a Rutgers graduate, you know, Randall Pinkett, who um, we put him on the cover of this uh, boulder back in the 90s, and we thought he was going places, and so so far he hasn't proved us wrong. So. And um, oh, buried in there, I'll make another CRFP plug, it's a very subtle one. That computer to the right of Randall Pinkett is a Silicon Graphics workstation. And CRFP alum Mark Hanna, who was my year, um, went to Stanford just like me, but he went to Stanford in the more lucrative field of electrical engineering. And he got his PhD and was co founder of the company Silicon Graphics. Uh, back then, they had made those those graphic workstations, gave you the special effects for Terminator 2 and Jurassic Park. And so, um, so you really have three CRP stories there in that, in that picture. Meanwhile, back to Wayne, this is how the trajectory of his career, you know, undergrad at, at Princeton, he graduated in 73, and then he got his PhD at Stanford in 78. And then during his time, and then he went to work for a phone company, uh, Bell, and then he became a department head unit director. And then he worked up to becoming a vice president of management systems product realization. You know, days of loosened technologies. Now, I wanted to find more photos of him, you know, in the sort of corporate mode. That's when, when I met him, you know, so. Um, but I guess during the time he had, I mean, this was like before the internet was really getting started. And so after the internet, people and companies, they took lots of pictures and you can find them all on the internet. And you can't really find too many pictures of him in corporate. But I, then I realized the picture in the, in the center, see the picture on the right, that's his uh, graduation photo from uh, Princeton. The one in the center is from the Princeton Library Archives. You know, they're talking about black students. That, that he came there at a time where a lot of black students were going to Princeton for the first time. And then I thought, well, okay, this is in a way the more iconic photo for Wayne because, because for, you know, for all my colleagues at, you know, you know, who are the faculty at Princeton, uh, I think they should remember that uh, you know, if a young black person taking their class may go on to create algorithms that are fundamental part of new operating systems, or they may become corporate executives afterwards. Uh, they'll do all these things, but they will come into your classroom looking like this. Okay, so, so I think it's a good thing for, you know, for my colleagues to keep in mind. <laughs> So, um, uh, this is where, I, okay, so, so Clyde came to the labs in 70, 1970, and then Wayne got the Bell Labs Fellowship Program in 1973. So I popped in in 1977. That's when I graduated from Princeton as a math major, and I got the Bell Labs Fellowship. And, um, oh, on the right, um, that's my later life, you know, becoming a Princeton professor. Robert was my first uh, graduate student, uh, first PhD, and um, standing next to him at the graduation is John Nash, you know, a beautiful mind. Oh, we didn't know this until we talked to him that he had been an undergraduate at Carnegie Mellon, and then Robert's first position was going to be in the public policy school at Carnegie Mellon. Now on the uh, left, that's like a schematic of a invention. Um, well, it's, it's patent. So, you know, 
in a math business, this doesn't happen to us very often. So this is like, uh, in fact, we just kind of said, well, you know, we've got an interesting queuing model. Why not see if we can get a patent for it? You know, just for bragging rights. So, and um, so it turns out, like I was saying before, I was the second um, Black Princetonian to get a um, um, Bell Labs fellowship. And um, so how do I make it? And so I, I guess informally, this event had like a 1984 cutoff line. So I just barely got in there, you know, go <laughs> um, I got the fellowship in 77. And this is my first publication. Okay. And uh, co authored with John Morrison, you know, the of the uh, Mathematical Sciences Research Center. Oh, I should also mention my mentor in the fellowship program was James McKenna, who was the department head. And so he introduced me to uh, John Morrison. And I uh, just want to show you, though, the uh, PDFs don't tell you everything. OK, so yes, this is my paper. But let's go back to the original journal that the Bell Labs Technical Journal this was in. And you open up the journal, and you'll see this. Okay, so, um, and upstairs you'll see the pictures of the two Nobel Prize winners of, you know, Arnold Penzias, and I guess it's Thomas Wilson, who um, got their Nobel Prize for discovering the background radiation for the Big Bang. And um, so I'm thinking to myself, okay, I haven't even started grad school yet. You know, I, got, I just got out of college. And then one thing I learned to love about mathematical culture is that when you write articles, authors come in alphabetical order. Okay. And um, then it's the first paper of the journal. And on the other side of the page is a photo of two Nobel Prize winners. Okay, so I, I think I think this is a company I wouldn't mind working for. Okay. And so that's the uh, copy of the journal of that issue. Okay. Now, uh, from the 70s, you jump to the 90s. This is uh, the, the one patent I did with a uh, colleague, Ward Witt. And the reason I, um, I was going to promise I should know my math formulas, I broke my promise here. Um, but here's why, because we were looking at models for telephone call centers. And we noticed there's a lag effect when you have time varying rates. And that's important to know if you're trying to come up with an efficient server staffing algorithm. Okay, fine. But now let's jump ahead 30 years. We discover a lag effect is front page news in the New York Times. <laughs> okay, because instead of people making telephone calls, it's people being infected with COVID. And instead of using, you know, using a telephone operator, engaging with them, or using a telephone trunk line, you um, have a patient make, making use of an ICU. Okay. And they're not doing curing theory, they're just plotting real data. And notice the red curve is like the plot of the what we would call an arrival rate okay but the orange would be like the blue queuing quantity it's like the load and those are what it says for the orange uh icu patients 14 days later so they put in the time lag of 14 days and noticing they're peaking at you know almost about the same time so so that lag effect we saw in queuing theory where all we were thinking about was uh, telephone call centers um, has relevance to looking at um, hospital operations, you know, especially during a pandemic because you certainly get surges in time during arrivals. So, so I wouldn't dare talk about all the math I went through in my career, but I can summarize what influence my mathematics, you know, because I started working at a phone company and queuing theory was invented actually almost 100 years ago 
to look at issues of designing communication systems. And um, so during our time at Bell Labs, I was looking at innovations in the direction of communications. And so as you go from telegraphs, um, oh, a little trivia for you. AT&T stands for American Telephone Telegraph. Now, notice that telegraph is digital communications for humans. And then we had this period of uh, analog communications. Uh, but at the end of the 20th century, we back when we, with the internet, we went back to digital communication. So, we, you know, so kind of digital communication went full circle in the 20th century. So um, as you, you know, time working there, we found we wanted to go from looking at how do you build communication systems to issues of how you use them. You know, you're offering these communication services. And um, then I went to Bell, uh, left there, went to Princeton, went to OR department, and then we found that um, resource sharing was an important um, generalization of communication services. You know, you don't buy a radio channel, you lease it when you make a phone call. Well, when you go to a hospital, you don't buy a hospital bed, you lease that too. Okay, so queuing mathematics is applicable to all of these applications. And the more you look at the different areas, it sort of forces you to expand and generalize the math and make new contributions in all directions. Oh, so I mentioned Orphe, so quick plug. Uh, like I said, everything I learned about diversity, I learned from Bell Labs. So I tried to do that when I was there. Um, okay, who are all these guys? Um, so three of them were um, some of my former uh, PhD students. I uh, had uh, three others. Um, and what's nice about these pictures, this does not give you the grand total of all black Princeton PhDs from operations research. You know, there's some others, um, but there are only, from faculty, there's only two of us, me and Ludovic, um, who joined about three years ago. And then we had Nicholas Johnson, who was an undergraduate major. This was a, um, an event, like a photo taken in 2018, right? So we skip ahead a little bit. Um, let's look at the guys on the bookends, the guys on the ends. What they end up doing? Okay. Nicholas, oh, by the way, plug for Nicholas. He's giving his commencement speech tomorrow morning. Okay. Is a delayed from class of 2020, you know, because of COVID. So he became the first black valedictorian in the 274 year history of Princeton University. Enough. Uh, Robert, um, just last year, he was appointed by Joe Biden to be the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Research and Technology in the United States Department of Transportation. Like I said, resource sharing services. And so all that queuing theory is now being focused on um, you know, like bottlenecks of um, shipping ports, you know, shipping containers at ports. Okay, so that's uh, that's a big queuing problem too. And so, so you'll be happy to you know a well-trained person is <laughs> working on those issues. Okay. And so he was sadly the final because of the program it came to an end. So he was like the final. And of course, I'm glossing over. Yeah, you know, I was warning Jim because he said oh, I should talk about CRP. I think that's that's a whole other hour talk by itself. And so I've skipped over eight other uh, CRP alums who graduated from Princeton. You know, and then I'm not. We're not even talking about other schools. Okay. So now we come to Marion Croak and. Um, <laughs> So it's chronological order. So it's Link Hawkins, 1942, and then Jim, 1959, and then 
Clyde in 1970, Wayne 1973, me 77, and then Marion shows up in 1982. Okay. And uh, worked at AT&T, uh, but currently and uh, more recent times is at Google. And um, so she was undergrad at Princeton, but in psychology. And I don't know if she was like me because I was undergrad at Princeton in math and she was undergrad in psychology. Um, I never thought I'd end up working at a basically electrical engineering company. I didn't know they'd want me, you know, no. so. <laughs> but, um, it was a different time, it was a different time. I actually had, um, in graduate school. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh like sure. Me. Is this, yeah. In graduate school, I uh, had double majors in psychology, social psychology and quantitative analysis. And so the combination of the two, I think made me more attractive to Bell Labs at the time, which still had a human factors department. Mm -hmm. So I was hired to work in human factors. And because of all the chaos, the business chaos that was happening at the time, within about six months, maybe less, they broke up the department. And so we were all asked to find other positions within Bell Labs, or maybe it, it wasn't at and Labs quite yet, but it was Bell Labs. And so I decided to go into systems engineering and I developed a fondness for looking at very, sure. So I developed a, a fondness for looking at and trying to understand very complex integrated systems. And I've been stuck in that space all my life and, and enjoyed it, enjoyed it a lot. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, I've been noticing in my field of operations research that a lot of our interests seem to be pointing us more, more in the direction of the social sciences. And I think about the good old days of Bell Labs, you yes. know, the monopolies. There was a vibrant psychology department, there was human factors, yes. there was the economics department. <clears throat> yes. So this always seemed to be a natural part of engineering. Yes, yeah. and, and I'm, now I'm in uh, Google research, and it's interesting because I have started a center there for what's called responsible AI and human-centered technologies. And it's fascinating because it's, it's got multidisciplinary, uh, the, the disciplines that are there range from people who have worked in human rights to die hard machine learning experts, um, but also social scientists as well to help us understand from a user's point of view, what needs to be thought of. And even for quite a while, while I was uh, working in other parts of Google, the combination of the two aspects of my brain and I guess my training in terms of being interested in humans as well as technology played out. I uh, My role was to develop reliability methodologies for YouTube and the ads business that Google uses to support itself and to make lots of money. And these were all very complicated systems. And people would look at the reliability by looking at it from one system to another to another, as opposed to looking at the fact that maybe we're saying YouTube has 95% reliability, but from a user's point of view, it may be down to 70% because they're not receiving the videos that they typically are asking for, or it's too much jitter or, um, latency in the network. And so we started to measure the reliability by what we called the user experience. And so we, we, we definitely look at the systems, but we first look at what the user may be experiencing and then go into the systems. So we kind of flipped it around, which is another thing that I'm also doing right now in responsible AI is trying to flip things around a bit. So let's not optimize just for accuracy, just for performance, but let's also look at unfair bias and the lack of transparency and, and try to 
look at those in the same light as something as important as accuracy. Okay. So let me also mention Marion's also in the National Inventors Hall of Fame. for the voice over internet protocol, or VOIP technology. And had a quick little graphic illustrates what this is. Okay, so you have a uh, device equipped with one of Jim's uh, microphones and um, it converts, as you speak into it, it will convert your voice into a digital uh, string. So it's the digital string you just send through the internet. And then when it comes out the other end of the internet, you just convert that back into voice. And then the other person on the other end can hear what you were saying. So that's for you, voice over IP. So that's our idea of voice over IP. And so you were talking to me about how this was we came up with this concept that a lot of people at ATT were, were initially a little scared. They were, they were actually, they thought it was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and they told me so, you know, they said it, it was, the internet was a toy and it was never developed uh -huh. to carry voice and it could never be made reliable enough to carry business grade traffic. So, but they gave me a lab and I had a few people who were true believers like I was, and it was during kind of the, there was a lot of um, excitement at the time, because not only was the internet becoming much more popular, but also packet networks were being developed to carry a lot of business traffic as well. And so there was a lot of, um, you know, tension and excitement about what should be the packet network that we carry this voice traffic on. And no one at all thought it should be the IP network. Um, there were things that were called um, asynchronous mode transfer mm -hmm. that was very expensive and proprietary, but it was perfect for carrying voice. S similar to all the work these gentlemen did in making the, the uh, core network in at t suitable for voice. It was profoundly designed to carry voice <clears throat> and to have dedicated channels. So now, you know, the internet at the time was like a wild west and the mosaic browser was just coming into being. And I thought, let's give it a try. You know, I think we could do this. And it was much more difficult than I thought it would be, but we did do it and we got it to scale. We got it to be reliable. And today I would say, you know, VoIP is used to carry, I would say maybe 95% of the voice traffic in the world. So now I have to give credit to these, these gentlemen because I walked into Bell Labs and I thought this is heaven you know, but think of all the work that had gone on before I got there. And um, I wish you had come to Google. <laughs> 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 because now I understand what it means to be a trailblazer. People called this being a trailblazer, but this was easy. So <laughs> compared to, to kind of you know, being on your own at Google and it, it's changing, it's getting better, but there's certainly not the supportive programs that were put in place in Bell Labs, but we'll get there. Okay. Now, technically this brings to an end the presentation part of the program. And I guess we go into Q and A and you got more questions for Marion, go right ahead. <laughs> this has been amazing. And it's just sort of remarkable what has come out of your collective brain. So I want to thank you all for your generous time tonight. So thanks, everybody. For being here.
then are there any questions? Uh, we'll go back and forth from the room to Zoom and back and forth because you know okay. that technology lets us do that. Right. So are there any questions immediately here? Oh, there we go. I have a question about the With initial rollout, does that include SMS and our chat? Or was that picture added later? So it's interesting that chat is designed to um, <clears throat> work over the signaling network. Um, so it was a long time before it was where it even needed to go over IP. So that's why so often, even today, you can lose you know, your, your um, connection and you can still get chat messages. Yeah, you can still get your you could lose your internet connection and still get chat messages because it's running over the signaling network. All right, Debbie on zoom. Do we have a question? We do have a question. This first question is for Dr. West. Can you hear me, Dr. West? I can hear you. Hi. Um, when you patented the Electra condenser microphone, were you aware that it would democratize audio recording technology? Did you realize its impact revolutionizing anthropological fieldwork, journalism, activism, music, film, theater, and countless other places, portable, low power, smaller, discrete recording is required? And thank you for your work, both former and current. And this is, um, I won't tell you who it's from yet, so you can answer the question first. Short answer is no. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, it's kind of difficult to see how new technology is going to fit into the overall world of uh, communications, in, in, in my case. Um, I did not know that it would, uh, that, that it would be as popular and take over the microphone industry as it did. But there are very good reasons for it. And the first is it's a linear system. It doesn't provide any distortion at all. And if it did provide distortion, then the over IP would not work. Right. Yeah. So these things are very interconnected and depend on each other uh, for survival. Uh, uh, I will never forget the first communications from outer space was extremely limited to the number of words and the type of words because the transmission was so poor. But digital signal processing along with a, a clean microphone that didn't provide distortion, because for some reason, compression algorithms will take distortion and amplify it and make it louder and more prevalent. And so you hear more of the distortion in the speech you're trying to listen to. So the answer is, I, I, I wish I had had a crystal ball. If I, if I did, um, uh, I'd probably own this place. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Debbie, who asked the question? Okay, so this was asked by Seth Cluett, current artist in residence in acoustics at Nokia Bell Labs and director, Columbia University Computer Music Center. <laughs> so didn't have a vested interest in the answer at all. <laughs> right. Do we have another question in the room? I do, and it's to Marion. Uh, and it's simply because of the controversy about AI and transhumanism and concerned about what your philosophy is about it. I mean, you took an atom and made it like an atomic bomb. I mean, there are just so many you know, ways to look at this thing. What are you doing today? Yeah, so <clears throat> it's amazing what benefits AI can provide. But the concerns about it are real and should be taken seriously. And the way these models are trained, I, I loved what you said about, you know, they can they can amplify what's worse in society. And, you know, there was a, and there still is a lot of excitement in terms of what AI can do. But it, what happened was there was a period of time where the 
the negative part of it was ignored. And so now we're in a catch up mode to help correct some of what's been done and to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And it's, it's a challenging problem because it's so dynamic. And there, um, I was talking to Jen about this earlier, there are multiple variables that are in conflict with each other. And somehow you have to find the state of where there, you can optimize across variables that typically fight with each other. <clears throat> and by that, I mean things like um, transparency versus privacy. You know, those, those are competing mm -hmm. variables, but somehow you have to find an optimal state for both of them. So that's, that's what I'm looking for now. And people think, are you kidding me? <laughs> do you think you're going to be able to do that? And it's like, yeah, I think we can do it. And right now we're doing other things in terms of, you know, coming up with all types of ways to, to address um, some of the more dangerous aspects of AI. But I feel like they're band-aids until we can get a control system in place to really do it in a more automated way. Um, but it's something that we need to be very careful about. Very careful about. Yeah, especially with autonomous systems. Yeah. They, autonomous systems. So the other thing that we're doing is trying to make things autonomous with human control so that they're levers that people can you know can provide their input into what is going to happen so it's not just you're defaulting to a system but you're doing it in collaboration with the system thank goodness nothing disastrous like world changing has happened quite yet but we've come close yeah oh well that'll keep us up at night <laughs> um, all right on that note debbie something from zoom <laughs> well you know it's interesting to have a panel of all these trailblazers so what i'm getting here are a lot of um incredible thank you so i have to just quickly go through um dr massey thanks for the invite from henry coleman wonderful program appreciation for all the work you and the panel have done he is from princeton uh 73 He's Wayne's classmate. Um, another person, good evening, Marion. I am so very proud of you and all your accomplishments. Thank you for being my mentor. During my years at at and Labs, I learned so very much. Being a program manager for software development that has served mm -hmm. me in my career after at and continue to be the trailblazer at Google and inspire future engineers. This is from Trisha Miller. And um, I have one here. Are you, oh, here we go. Um, what events, and this is to everyone, all four of you, I guess quickly, um, what events or persons had the greatest impact on your decision to become a mathematician or scientist? And to Marion in particular, you were a young mom with three kids. How? <laughs> <laughs> all right, Marion, let's start first. with you because that's a loaded question. <laughs> So that's what I often ask myself, like, how did, how did I do this? Um, I should say we. Um, I was married until the children became teenagers. And then it's like, how did I do it, right? Um, but they actually helped me a lot in terms of stimulating my creativity. And to this day, they're in their late 20s, early, early 30s. There are three of them. And um, they're lovely children. They're, they're fine. But you still think, what, you know, are, are, are they really fine? I'm going to keep working. I know that. And are they really fine? So it's, it's almost like a day by day thing, I think, to be a, a mother, a working mother. Um, and it continues. It continues to this day. And they, they seem fine. But, you know, it's like, is this going to stay fine? <laughs> And I do have a grandson now, so it's wonderful. So other sort of 
Debbie opened the question is you went into a field and you were often a minority in the room. How was that? To me? Anybody. Yes, to you. <laughs> <laughs> Who were the inspiration? What what made you go there? Was there anyone in particular, anything in particular that made you choose the path you chose? The one thing that I can think of is uh, my aunt Dorothy. Um, uh, and she comes to mind because uh, they lived in Buffalo and we know what's going on there now. Uh, but um, she would always bring or send me books. And one book I will never forget was a book about Benjamin Franklin flying a kite in a thunderstorm. And that's something I wanted to do and my grandmother and my mother would not allow it. <laughs> they were afraid that I'd get hurt. I said, well, Franklin didn't get hurt. He's... <laughs> but um, but th th that was certainly one of the strong motivations uh, for me were things that I could read about people that I wanted to be like when I grew up. Uh, in fact, uh, that's this very question that I asked Link Hawkins when I joined Bell Labs. And he said, his, his response was, I'll teach you what I know, but that's not gonna be enough. So he warned me that he could, t there were things he could tell me, but there were things that he didn't even know. But the, the important part of, uh, of the story that I'd like to leave you with is that collaborations are vital for success these days. Um, uh, we've gone from authors being half the publication to single author papers. Single author papers have gone away because there's no way that one person can maintain all of the information that's necessary to advance a field because it's so broad, so complicated. <laughs> And um, I'm going to stop now because I don't want to get wound up. Oh, um, one thing I was thinking about was in terms of being a minority. Uh, well, you see, one thing you don't may not appreciate, okay, from the perspective of the minority person, uh, they walk into a room and the room looks homogeneous. So, you know, we don't notice there's some anomaly there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you know, that's everybody else. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, the other thing is that um, what I always tell students is that um, kind of walk through these steps. Like, what is the most important thing in research? It's coming up with new ideas. You know, you don't get any points for re reproving old ideas. Okay. What's the easiest way to come up with new ideas? Well, if you just look at things differently than some of the other researchers. Well, what's the easiest way to look at things differently than other researchers? Well, if you come from a completely different cultural background than the other researchers. You know, so, so being a minority in creative areas is a plus. You know, it gives you, uh, makes it easier for you to come up with different angles and looking at things because you you know you just just it's just going to come natural to you yeah I, i've i've experienced that as well like it is almost a benefit to to not be part of a a closed system almost you know and you so you're always seeing something different and something new the one thing i would say for me is that coming back to bell labs um, my first department head there was Randy Pilk, and he was he was really a, a he was a student of Claude, Claude Shannon, and he had said to me, you know, you hear my voice, it's kind of soft, right? If I took the microphone away, you wouldn't be able to hear me, and that's just my natural voice. I'm small and tiny, petite, so definitely. I was a new kind of thing that showed up, right? <laughs> and and he would say to me, "You are the, your voice is the most important voice in that room," and and he would just give me that type of encouragement, which 
I found to be remarkable because he would say it and then I would believe it. And I would, I was always a quiet person, but when I would talk, people would acknowledge what I was saying. You know, people would acknowledge it. And I, I think that level of confidence is absolutely necessary when you look and are different than most people that you're around. All right, Clyde, you're out there on the Zoom. What do you, <laughs> any? Well, two things. Basically, I was a born scientist because when I was three years old, I was doing experiments on Christmas lights and electric, uh, <laughs> electric lighters. I was doing, you know, smoking up the room and breaking the liquids and putting it into the uh, electric lighter to see what would happen. My mother would wake up saying, you're trying to kill everybody. And so <laughs> I, that was at three years old. And the other thing is, uh, when I was growing up, I used to watch Mission Impossible. And there was an actor, Greg Morris. And he was an electronic expert. He knew lasers and physics. And I said, you know what? That's what I'm going to be. I'm going to be him, but I'm going to be the real deal because he's an actor. I'm going to really be the real deal. I'm going to know that stuff. And that, that's basically what inspired me. And then my grandmother, she taught me how to meditate. And I used to read books on Einstein and, and he would visualize uh, himself being a small particle on an electromagnetic wave. And I said, you know, I, I should be able to do that too. And basically that's the way, the way I learned to do physics by visualizing and seeing the physics and the electrodynamics in real time. You know, if you, somebody says you can't do it, then you don't do it. But when I teach my students, people can see that I'm literally seeing the physics as it happens, which is why I take equations. And I try to get paragraphs and stories from equations. There's an equation that, that scientists like to, to mess around with calls the Schrodinger, uh, Schrodinger equation. It's the equation of where all the energy is. It's a differential equation, but you know, I would visualize that kind of stuff and build my experiments based on those type of equations, which got one of my students a PhD. And uh, I got quite a few students of PhDs on some of the work that I was doing at Bell Labs. I had like five graduate students at one time and they all got PhDs based on the work that I was doing. So basically that, that's the way I always approach things. Well, I think it's very clear all of your brains work very differently than mine. Um, and that Bell Labs was really a remarkable moment in time for all of you, but also for America and how these um, inventions and technological advancements that you all were a part of really have changed the landscape of America today or the world today. Um, and so we only have a few minutes left. So I think now is just do you have any parting words for us as we look to the future and look forward Take one more oh one more question <laughs> okay one more question and then you have your uh, moment this is probably uh, more for dr west than anyone else uh i'm an engineer that graduated from city college ccny in new york and um maybe you could you you know join bell labs early i joined bell labs after i got out but when i got out of City College, which was largely Jewish, um, Jews and Blacks didn't apply to the Bell system. I mean, it was our understanding that the Bell system did not hire Blacks and Jews. And so we were surprised when, you know, uh, some of my uh, classmates, a couple of uh, Jewish classmates and I ended up at Bell Labs. So you were there early. I'm not sure what your experience was, but how did Bell Labs get this? Reputation. It's a very good question. Thank you for asking it. Um, actually, I chose Bell Labs because I saw more people that looked like me that were doing what I wanted to do when I grew up than any place else. And I'm talking about IBM, I'm talking about Xerox, I'm talking about most of the major companies that were doing research at that time, IBM. Uh, and uh, a good, good example. There are 33 black inductees into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. Not all Americans, but black. Four, Link Hawkins, 
my colleague here, and, um, and Victor Lawrence, who was your director, right? Uh, the four black in inductees from Bell Labs. So there was a culture there before I got there. I think of people like Charlie Miller, like Ray Story, Bill Northover, all were doing what I wanted to do when I grew up. And so you've got some bogus information, I'm sorry to say, you should have shown up. You would have enjoyed the place too. But I did work there. I mean, yeah. I, I ended up here, but sort of accidentally. Okay, so some- Miller was a Tuskegee chemist in Tuskegee yeah, that goes back to Clyde. So is my first cousin. Okay, so do we have some parting thoughts as we look forward into all of the marvelous work you've done? I, I would say if you're around young people, and I'm, I guess, I don't know if it's fortunate. I, I am, I'm fortunate to be around young people. Most of the people at Google are much younger than me. Um, but if if you can give them words of encouragement, it's amazing um, what can happen to someone who feels like they're in a marginalized position or they're underdogs. Just a bit of encouragement, how much they'll bloom and blossom. Um, so that would be my parting words. I think. Um, oh. A lot of issues, but one thing I think of out is um, some people don't realize how easy, uh, how simple some of these things are. Okay, so for example, you know, how do I just happen to know, you know, like in, you know, 2018, you know, how did I happen to know the first black valedictorian of uh, going to be the first black valedictorian of Princeton or, you know, Robert or somebody who is, um, you know, uh, now working for the Biden administration. So he's a um, um, deputy director, you know, to the secretary of education. Okay. Um, okay, so what strategies did I form ahead of time to make sure I was meeting these sort of people? Okay, so I'll take an example of Robert. So about 1999, I've been the summer. <clears throat> I was just keeping a low profile and not doing much that summer and not talking to students. And suddenly this kid knocks on my door and then it's, uh, you know, it's Robert, you know, and says, oh, I'm an undergraduate, I'm an electrical engineering major from the University of Cincinnati. I wanna say hi. So, so, you know, what my brilliant strategy was just to say hi back to him. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's all. You know, you just say hi to people. Okay, so, uh, or Nicholas. I had a colleague who was running an optimization seminar. And, you know, so I'm showing up to, uh, you know, support his event, and he was organizing a poster session. So I look at the room, and I see only one black kid there doing a um, poster. So I just walked by and say hello. And that's how I met Nicholas. And then it was just a month later, he found himself in that picture you saw, you know, in like 2018. So, um, but it just starts with simple things like that. You know, there's nothing, you know, elaborate or, you know, strategic you have to do. It's just a matter of meeting people and talking to them. Clyde or Jim, anything? Yeah, a lot goes through my mind hearing other people talk, but I don't know. Maybe I'll try one of them anyway. Um, I uh, really made my family uh, angry with me when I decided to go from pre-med to physics. Uh, in fact, uh, my father introduced me to two PhDs in chemistry who were working on in the railroad or in the post office because that was the best job that they could get. 
and my father always thought that I was taking the long road to working in the post office. So, <laughs> uh, and but um, I, I'm glad I stuck with, with with my own mind, although it cost me dearly, because uh, I went from rags from riches to rags, if you know what I mean. Uh, but that was okay because I learned some lessons uh, there too. Um, the the it's been said a number of times, we can do anything we want to do, but our children don't know it. And we need to carry it. One of the reasons that I'm here, one of the real reasons that I'm here is to reach to young people because they are the future. And, and believe me, what I have, what Marion has, what Bill has, we can't, it's not solely ours. It's to a class of people who were born into, Clyde has used this phrase a lot of times, who were made, who were born to do what they're doing. And we have too many people that are born to do what they should be doing that are not. And we've got to fix that. Clyde, do you have parting words? I would thank a few people. One would be my wife because she pushes me. She puts all my scientific achievements together because I throw them in a the corner and, and they put, just pile up like garbage, including some of my checks. She used to come to my house before we got married. <laughs> and she would look at all the garbage put, put, you know, put together and go through the drawers and said, what, what do you want to do with this? I said, throw it away. It was a $500 check. I didn't just put it in the drawer. And she said, you need to get together. So <laughs> anyway, I, I have to thank her for getting my, myself together. But my mother has to come up because when I was a kid, she told me one thing that stuck and it helps at, uh, at a place like Bell Laboratories. She said, anything you put your mind to, you can do it. She said, don't ever tell me what you can't do, just do it. And her saying to me was always a hard try beats a failure. And so I always had that in my mind. So I had the, the idea that whatever I'm going to do, I'm not going to fail. And so if you tell somebody at Bell Laboratories that, that whatever you give you, give, give you, if, if you give me something to do, I'll do it. There's nothing you can give me that I can't do. They'll test you. That's how that camera came about. Because Bill Brinkman was, was my director, executive director. And he said, what about building a camera? He, remember, he, he, he heard what I had said to him one day. So I built him a camera, but they'll test you. And so those two people, wife and, and mother, I have to th thank them for that. Thank you. Well, I have to say on behalf of Morvan, this whole Bell Labs journey has been something entirely new for us. And it's been a lot of fun, but the Again, rock star panel, that's all I can describe you as uh, for tonight, has really been invigorating and exciting for us. And I cannot thank you enough for giving your time and expertise to our audience. And so thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank and thank you all. If you didn't see the show, I hope you come back. If you did see the show, I hope you come back again. Come true. And I want to thank Debbie Lambert Redmond for putting it all together. Thanks. Bill Massey, you did a nice job too. <laughs>